I'm Doug Sobey, the uh, president of the Bidek Area Historical Society, and I've long had an interest in history, and I'm doing research at the moment in forest history of Prince Edward Island. Uh, over a long, I've been doing it since 1996, and more or less traced every document associated with the forest, uh, from uh, going back to Jacques Cartier in 1534. So that's, that's my main area of research. I'm an origin and ecologist and environmental historian. This, uh, but I've uh, long had an interest in island history going back to my teen years. And I remember in school, we, Prince Edward Island didn't have a history. Uh, you got Canadian history, but Can Prince Edward Island was only mentioned in the Co Confederation Conference. Our books came from Ontario, so there was no local input at all. And uh, Canada equaled uh, Ontario and Quebec, and that was the way it was in those days in history. Uh, but I remember I found in my uh, grandparents, uh, oh, up in the attic almost, a school book, a uh, Prince Edward Island school book dating from 1900. And lo and behold, it was British, it told the history of the British, um, British Empire and such, but at the back, there was a chapter, A History of Prince Edward Island. Uh, and so in 1900, the school kids were all getting local history of that sort. And it, it, it covered up to, uh, it went through all the governors and so forth. And so that aroused, I, I realized there was a local history. And so I'll be talking today on an aspect of local, very local history in this particular area. But Bedeck Harbor uh, does, uh, it's the equivalent of Summerside Harbor. It became, Summerside didn't exist. It was always called Bedeck Bay and Bedeck Harbor. And the Bedeck River, which was the Dunk, uh, Holland named it the Dunk, but he notes on his map, by the French, he writes on the map, by the French, Riviere du Bedeck, du Bedeck, the, the river, Bedeck River. So, the Bedeck Harbor loyalists, um, where did they settle and why? And that's going to be my uh, topic today. I gave this talk in 2018, uh, so um, uh, I'm repeating it, but with some additions to it. And 2018, anyway, is six years ago. You pro if you were here, you probably have forgotten most of it anyway, or are back to hear a second version. Uh, just a summary of what um, I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to say, tell you who were the Bedeck Harbor loyalists, what was their background, that is, where they had come from, uh, the history prior to uh, arriving in this Bedeck Harbor area, where in this uh, general Bedeck Bay area they settled, why they settled in those particular areas, and it's very uh, patterned uh, uh, distribution, it's not even. And why did they come to Bedeck? Why did they all come to Bedeck in the first place? Now, if um, you want a reprise of the lecture, a lot of the material is in the poster outside uh, on our display board since 2018. And that actually shows where the Bedeck Harbor loyalists. So I'll be, I'll be looking at that. So I'm talking about the content of that poster. And why the Loyalists settled in the deck is largely covered in an adjacent poster. So let's um, consider who were the Bedeck Harbor Loyalists. Well, if you want the answer to that question, all you have to do is go outside and look at that monument. And uh, on that monument is a bronze uh, plaque, very well researched, and I think largely researched by and created by Doris Haslam who was the chief historian and the author of the Rites of Bedeck and a contributor to the Spearman genealogy and the island refuge. And uh, we have a display on Doris Haslam in the, uh, to give credit to her in the museum this summer. The uh, Bedeck Harbor Loyalist, you've got the date on it, the 4th of August. Let's look at, uh, I'll just take it back there. It's, um, it commemorates those loyalists who arrived on the August 4th, 1784. 
Now, let's look at what it lists. It lists a lot of other uh, loyalists, as we shall see. And these are the ones, the names, that of the people that arrived the 4th of August, 1784, that are grouped into refugees, which was the term uh, of the day, uh, the loyalist refugees, or just the refugees, because they were fleeing from one country, kicked out or fleeing, and so uh, were the same as we use the term today, refugees. But there were also disbanded troops, uh, who troops who had uh, fought in the American colonies in support of the uh, the government, uh, 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 sometimes uh, raised in the colonies. They're not uh, British troops as such. They're colonists uh, who had fought. Uh, uh, as in provincial regiments in support of the government. And uh, you will notice uh, the names there. I'll come back and look at the names. But it also lists the later arrivals, saying before the conclusion of the century, the area was also set up by the following individuals. So these are uh, the Bedeck Harbor Loyalists. Well, let's look at this um, list more closely. Uh, it contains, if we look at the number of figures, 37 named men plus 9 wives are usually just listed as wife, and 21 children uh, are listed uh, just as counts. Uh, these comprise the uh, group called, well, if we include, yeah, including uh, the later arrivals. Some names are common in the community, and you will recognize these names. Skirman is a very common name here still. Wright, Silliker, Murray, Waugh, Strang, uh, Linkletter, McFarlane, Small, Ricks, uh, 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 less so in the deck, but up west, uh, lots of Ricks is up west. Lafergy, those are all names that you could say you, you would know people of those names in the community. And many of them in some cases. Other names have died out within living memory. Uh, and these include, these in red, uh, Anderson. Uh, the last Anderson, the per person of that name, uh, died in the 1930s. Uh, he was the only boy in a family with five girls, but the girls, some of them left descendants, uh, but there are no people of the Anderson name remaining. Green, as far as I know, there are no, uh, although Daniel Green, he, he was in the Summerside area, I don't know if there are any descendants of that name. I may be wrong. There's still Greens here. Yeah, there are Greens which don't descend from uh, Daniel Green. You know, that's the... And Hooper died with, uh, within living memory of people in the room, probably. Valerie, you knew a Hooper, didn't you? And there are no Hoopers remaining, as far as I know. Darby, I went to school with uh, Claire Darby in Summerside, but they've all left um, uh, the island uh, uh, in living in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia. And um, those are the ones within living memory. And then there are others who uh, have never been common or even present after the 18th century. They came and quickly left. And I click those in blue here. Uh, the McDonald, McDonald's an extremely common name, but they're not descendants of the John McDonald, the Loyalists. And Brecon, but Brecon, uh, they went to Charlottetown, and I don't know if there's still Breckens in Charlottetown or not, but a very common name in the late 19th century. Hancock, Sensabach, a way that's a left descendants, but that was way, he went way down to Murray Harbor. And you see other names there. Uh, uh, Wood, uh, Palmer, Moorefield, maybe. And we'll trace where some of these people went, why they uh, didn't stay in the deck very long. Well, here is a, a, an interesting postcard from 1900. Four generations of the Silica family of Bedeck. A photographer must have been going along the road, saw these uh, farmers work, working their field. That would be in Lower Bedeck. 
just at the bottom where the monument and the church are, some, uh, or the cemetery is, and uh, they uh, are were considered so quaint that they, uh, whether he paid them a fee, but, uh, which is the oldest four generations, perhaps the man on the extreme left is the, the grand, great grandfather, I guess so, yes. So that's, but there's still Silicers and Borden and um, I don't, you know, St. Helena's, yes. And they would uh, descend, I don't know, who, we don't know who these people are, but I don't think it would take too many, uh, too much research to find out who they, they are. Uh, so let's uh, look at the, those that arrived on August uh, 4th. How do we know that these people arrived on August 4th uh, in this uh, group? We know it because the muster list survives, and you won't be able to read that, but I'll, it's a, it, at the top it says, uh, uh, it's uh, enlarging it there, it says, the muster roll, that's just a, a sort of a, an assembly to count of the following disbanded and discharged soldiers and loyalists who with their families arrived from Shelburne at Charlottetown in the island of St. John on the 26th of July. So they arrived at Charlottetown on the 26th of July. It took, it took them another uh, week and a bit to get to the deck. But they're all um, uh, listed individually, at least uh, not listed individually. The head, of, the head of the family is listed in each case. Uh, the, the, the columns um, um, note the, the, well, the, the, um, whether the status, whether they're a loyalist or uh, in a particular regiment. So there are 28 uh, individuals listed by name, 27 men, and one woman, and the woman is Sarah Palmer, uh, who was a widow, uh, is listed, and whereas all the others are men. And um, so let's look at those names. Eighteen of them are described as loyalists, uh, that is, they, they weren't military people. Uh, and then ten are disbanded soldiers. Uh, the, the regiments after the war, uh, they were uh, the soldiers were disbanded and were no longer in the regiment. And the two regiments listed, and the re particular regiments listed, the 17th Regiment of Light Dragoons, which is a cavalry regiment, eight of, eight of the individuals belonged to that, eight of the men, and the 7th Regiment of Foot uh, held two um, individuals. I haven't studied these uh, regiments in any detail, uh, but they would easily um, could easily be studied. Missing from the monument, and I don't know why, because Doris Haslam was fairly careful, are those two names, and their names occur on maps. David Staggs and Richard Garrett uh, don't appear on the monument. So is that an error, or had she some reason for leaving them off? The, um, but there are other names as well that are on the monument, but aren't in the list. So not all loyalists, even those that were there at the time, because they'd been previously mustered, or, and that's Thomas Hooper, sometime in June 1784. Richard Robbins, and you heard um, uh, Bonnie talking about Richard, that was the man who died uh, trying to get to Charlottetown and froze to death, and his son, uh, John Robbins. So they're not on this particular list, but they're, they're on the monument, because they've been previously mustered go back to that list, and it's usually very accurate. Uh, the later arrivals, uh, that is after 1784, uh, you get uh, later arrivals, but uh, an error here, uh, Thomas Hooper had already arrived, but he, he, his name should be on the monument, it's just put in the wrong section. He wasn't a later arrival, he had uh, arrived uh, before. So there are nine later arrivals, uh, and we'll look at those. Uh, now, Benj uh, Benjamin Darby, not in 1784, but 1785, and he came from New Brunswick. This was often so, that loyalists would stop for a time, uh, try St. John, or the St. John River Valley, 
find it not suitable and be uh, enticed or attracted to Prince Edward Island. So also Daniel Green, and so also George Linkletter, uh, not sure where George, without checking his genealogy, and the information may be available. So there arrived uh, uh, in 1785 or thereabouts. Uh, and then they settled at those particular places. Um, the Derby, if you go to Summerside City Hall, there is what's called the Derby Clock, which is, uh, was gifted to the city. Uh, it was a, a, a very large, long case of grandfather clock um, that belonged to that family, and it's well worth uh, looking at. It's just in the lobby at the front, and you don't have to speak to anyone to look at it. And it was brought from um, brought by the Darby family when they settled in. Uh, they managed to bring a, a, a you know a long case, large clock with them. So uh, which is um, what, it's the, often the, uh, the last thing you'd be able to bring with you uh, when fleeing. Uh, John Baker, an important name in the deck that seems to have more or less disappeared, lived owned land right on this very spot, uh, the farm that comprised this corner and in both directions, south and uh, west, and uh, intermarried with many loyalist families, uh, was certainly there by 1792 in central Bedeck. And then you get the um, other, uh, another group here, John's, I'm grouping these perhaps by year, John Small, 1790, also came from New Brunswick. Uh, John Lafergie, about 1790, arrived from Nova Scotia. And then Samuel Ricks, uh, 1790, through via New Brunswick. And they settled in those there, Wilmot. Um, Wilmot by Wilmot, I don't mean Wilmot Valley, I mean the area between Reed's Corner and Summerside, which was called Wilmot even in my day, uh, and uh, uh, Wilmot School District and Samuel Ricks in North Bedeck. And then two other very late arrivals, Alexander Anderson, we have a panel in the museum telling his story, arrived in 1797, but he had arrived on the island about 1785 at, and settled at Brackley, and Donald McFarland, uh, a couple of years later, moved from the same place. And they probably, well, they would have undoubtedly known each other lived in the same place, Brackley, and settled in the same place uh, at Sea Cow Head. But there are other later arrivals not named on the monument, and, uh, uh, and there's a reason. Uh, John Foy uh, arrived in 1785 from New Brunswick, but moved to Tryon, so he's only here for about three years, and the Foys of that area, and there are Foys in, in Tryon and Cropo area, descend from him. Uh, John Welling also arrived in 1785 from New Brunswick, but uh, 10 years later he moved to Shediac. Uh, and if there's a history of that family over there, I, I don't know. I've not looked at it. And another, Samuel Jameson, 1787 arrived about, and moved to Rishabukto. So there was movement of people. 1798 he moved to uh, Rishabukto. And John Strickland, uh, 1797, moved uh, from Lot 16 to the deck area. And he, he was mentioned in um, uh, um, the lecture on slavery by, uh, as having a slave with him by um, Mr. What's his name? Hornby. Hornby, yes, uh, uh, mentioned uh, Mr. Uh, John Strickland in his talk. So what was the background of these people? What did they have in common? Why these Bedeck Harbor Lois, especially the ones that arrived on August the 5th, uh, 1784? And uh, they had one very common experience, and that was of having ended up in New York City at some stage during the war, and having come to the island in 1784 via Shelburne in Nova Scotia. They may well not have known each other before, uh, known each other well before July 1784, but they were all living in Shelburne. No, have any of you been to Shelburne? Do you know? Some of you, quite a few. Uh, I'll talk about it later. And uh, uh, before that, they'd all lived in New York City. Uh, 
Uh, but some of the later arrivals had come via St. John, New Brunswick. The, the, uh, the importance of New York City, I will note in a moment, it, it um, was, uh, uh, that's a contemporary map of 1779, uh, of the New York City area. New York City was not anything like um, what it is uh, today. Manhattan Island is shown there. i get my pointer out here. Manhattan Island is this long island, and New York City is just where, at the very tip of it. This was all agricultural farmland, uh, Manhattan. And that is uh, Brooklyn, it says, that's Brooklyn. So it's all agricultural land, Kings and Queens County, and Staten Island. So it's all agricultural land, except for this little tip of uh, New York City. Well, uh, the reason that New York was very important is that it, it, the city and all of the surrounding area was under British control uh, throughout the war. It was the main military base that the British Army always had control of from seven, September 1776 when they vacated Boston, uh, they established a base and thus all of the people within that area were within the, uh, 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 the control of the, uh, under the protection, you could say, of the uh, British uh, government and or the military right to the very end of the war. And this, this is an actual military map, manuscript map, uh, of New York City. This is the tip of Manhattan, and you can see the red streets, and I'm sure those streets probably still uh, exist today uh, and would have names, but they're not named in the map. Uh, and uh, across the, uh, here would be Brooklyn. So this is the uh, city of New York uh, in 1782 or the town, almost town, it's much bigger than probably Charlottetown today. And that's a view of it uh, uh, in 1770 from across the uh, water. And the, the, the man in charge is well known in Canadian history, Sir Guy Carleton. Uh, um, he was the British commander at New York from May 1782, very end of the war, to November 1783, and he later became, he, he, with, he traveled with the loyalists to Canada and became the governor of uh, Upper Canada. And you've all heard of uh, Sir Guy Carleton, haven't you, in Canadian history? You're all naughty. <laughs> oh. And uh, so New York um, uh, City, from this satellite view, it looks like uh, 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 the whole of New England is wooded, uh, and it uh, probably is more wooded now than it was <coughs> a century and a half ago. Uh, there, at, at the time of the surrender, uh, in, in 1781, at the time of the surrender of, at Yorktown in um, uh, Virginia, uh, the war fighting then ceased, but it took some time before a treaty was negotiated. And so for about two years, this very large loyalist population, New York was a magnet for people. If you were tossed out of your community, you would go to New York City and you would be within British military protection and beyond the uh, mistreatment by the uh, patriots. And, uh, but with the, the, with the um, treaty uh, in 17... Uh, 83, the Treaty of Paris, I think it was called, uh, there was the evacua ev evacuation of the army, and all of these loyalists had to be evacuated uh, uh, as refugees from the city. And uh, the, uh, in, um, uh, the spring fleet, the first fleet to leave, uh, to Shelburne, to, uh, to Port Roseway, as it was called in Nova Scotia, uh, evacuated 3,037 persons. All, all of the people were counted, and uh, I, I'm not sure if they're normally named. Uh, later in Shelburne, they were. And uh, so they had to travel to what then became Shelburne, named after the British Prime Minister almost immediately, from, changed its name from Port Roseway. 
And this is just a general summary. 8,000, almost 9,000 people were evacuated to Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Uh, and even more, 14,000 were evacuated to St. John, and uh, 2,500 to Annapolis, and uh, almost 1,000 to Halifax uh, from, from New York, they, these people. And of course, uh, uh, the, the large influx of 14,000 people to St. John led to almost immediately the creation of New Brunswick, uh, which at that time uh, initially was under just part of Nova Scotia, but uh, it, the province of New Brunswick was created. Uh, Shelburne is, uh, uh, this is a view of Shelburne from a satellite today. It, uh, if we get a closer look, uh, you can see a very um, uh, a grid street pattern uh, uh, laid out by military, and it actually expanded much even up into this area. It now looks, uh, well, you can still see the street pattern, but it's, um, uh, the forest has sort of eaten away the uh, edge of the town. And the population, I don't even know what it is today, but it's not 8,000, it's probably in the hundreds. I, I went there in um, 2015, I think, and it's a, it's a beautiful place to visit, uh, not just its location, but it has so many old buildings and dating from the 1780s, because uh, many of the loyalists who arrived were well-to-do, and could build, and immediately built, uh, uh, houses. Uh, that's the harbor of Shelburne. And this is a house on the, uh, the waterfront street, uh, dating from the 1780s. And they're all maintained, uh, protected. And uh, uh, this is the bed and breakfast where I stayed in, which is another uh, early uh, uh, 18th century house. And, I'm just showing you there's another, but it's full of them. There's one corner where all four houses are dating from the 1780s. <coughs> and uh, it, it makes a, a lot of its loyalist heritage. This is the, uh, that's a museum building uh, part, part there. And these are also museum buildings uh, in, in uh, Shelburne, and including this one here. Uh, so the, going back to the uh, muster list, these are individuals who are named, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the, those that are um, in blue uh, are listed in the Shelburne land grant. So all of these people have been granted land in Shelburne. They've been granted uh, varying amounts of land and have intended to settle in Shelburne, 16 of the, the 28 on the list. But within a, a few years, very short year, within a year, they realized that, oh, you wouldn't want to, you can't farm here. You know, it's rock and uh, unfit for farming. Um, and at today, it, it's forest land and it's poor land. And that became very apparent. And so they began to look for places elsewhere uh, and began to move. But I'm going to now revert to looking uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the Shelburne, um, move from Shelburne to the island, uh, looking at where the Loyalists, uh, the Bedeck Harbor Loyalists came from. And uh, the homes of 13 Bedeck Loyalists before the Revolution, based on information contained in an island refuge. And there's a cluster, uh, really, from New York State and Westchester County, which is the County in pink, it goes. It's this area here, and you'll recognize the names Silic, or just across the border in Connecticut, Linkletter, Siliker, Strang, Wright, Lafurgy, Spearman, are all coming from that area. This was an area that of conflict in, in um, where people were divided, uh, about 50-50, and there was an area of conflict. Some areas were purely uh, r r royalist or supporting the government such as uh, Long Island, uh, at least the, the western part. And, uh, 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 but this was an area of conflict, and people had to leave off. You know, it was violent conflict. The, uh, uh, you were driven out if you were not in support, uh, and so there, there, were, there was conflict. Um, the uh, other uh, source of people, all had made their way to New York, 
is the cluster around Philadelphia, and the distance between, just to show, give you an idea, it's only 84 miles between Philadelphia and New York, which is the distance from here to Montague, perhaps, I'm not sure. It's, uh, you know, it's not that far, or Surrey uh, is the distance. So these people, uh, you see the Robbins family shown there, uh, they lived uh, uh, in New Jersey at Perth Amboy, uh, or, uh, which is now, uh, uh, it's on the fringes of New York City, but it's in New Jersey. Hoopers came from New Jersey as well. Uh, Baker's small and green from Philadelphia. And there was, uh, the, the Murrays were off the map here, but they're in New York, uh, upper New York, where they just arrived from Scotland, 1772. Um, and that area was settled by Scots uh, in upper New York. And they all remained fair, loyal to the government because they just arrived. They were British, what, what, you know, they weren't in the center of uh, initial conflict. So those are the, the, um, the source areas of the, uh, the Deck Harbor Loyalists. Uh, three of them were Quakers, the Bakers, the Greens, and the Wrights uh, were uh, at least the, the um, um, parent uh, of those who are Quakers. And Quakers often had a, a, a were running a very difficult uh, line of, uh, between the pa Patriots. Quakers were pacifists. Uh, and did not want to fight or sign up uh, as a, a tenet of the religion. And thus, they were viewed as, you know, if you're not with us, you're against us. So they had a difficulty with the patriots um, saying, if you're not going to fight for us, you're getting out. And uh, so uh, three of the, uh, I'm sure that's com common among New Brunswick uh, loyalists as well. So that's the um, background. Uh, they then came um, to the deck. Um, uh, I'll come later to explain how they got to the deck. I want to look where did the Bedeck Harbor loyalists settle, and by settle I mean establish a farm and actually live on it, and rather than just uh, you know um, own land or have your name on a map. And uh, the we can map the location of the farm properties using. Maps from 1784 or later. Here's an example. And we have very good maps in the provincial archives going back to the 1784. This is lot 25 and 26, and it shows all the loyalist grants. This is this is the um, Dunk River estuary. This is Lower Bedeck here. That's North Bedeck. That's inland. And uh, so it's, it's uh, and it shows all these, these are loyalist land grants being shown uh, at the time. And it, here's another map of uh, the Summerside, this is lot 17, which includes Summerside, and uh, uh, you've got the Deck Bay shown there, and if we enlarge a bit of it, you can see that area, it's got um, uh, two uh, names on it. Um, Benjamin Darby, 500 acres, and Daniel Green, 500 acres, and their properties are, are marked on the map. And uh, they're not beside each other directly, there's a space in, so this in between for some reason. So you have those maps. Uh, you also have, a uh, very important is this 1798 census of the island of St. John. It's the first British period census that survives with names. And it survives only because it was copied into a, uh, co the original doesn't exist, but a, a book published in 1875, History of Prince Edward Island, Duncan Campbell, copied the whole census. Otherwise, we would have lost it. Because uh, civil uh, servants didn't usually keep the, you know, the primary census records. They just were interested in the summaries. But that one survived and happened to be printed. And just to show you what these lots are before, uh, this is lot 17, that Summerside would be there. Lot 19 uh, with, uh, uh, that's the Wilmot River there. And then 25 and 26, that's North Bedeck and Lower Bedeck. And then 27 is uh, Shelton and areas. So um, this is the form, this is the actual pages from the 1879 history. 
and the loyalists are listed. There is lot number 19, Bedeck Bay. So we know that in 1798, uh, those people were resident. George Maybe, John Lafergie, James Bort, which is Waugh, and Jonathan Palmer. Uh, we uh, moving on to uh, lot 17. There are our uh, Benjamin Darby, Daniel Green, and a lot, you'll notice the Acadian names, all the Acadians. They were living on the north uh, part of Lot 17. And also in Lot 16 here, you'll see a lot, right along the shore where they'd been settled as tenant farmers. So that, this sort of information helps us to place them. And on the same uh, page or nearby, you've got the Lot number 25. You've got names like... Uh, the Loyalist names, uh, there are names that aren't Loyalists, but Samuel Ricks, William Wright, Jesse Strang, and also, I should point out, the numbers in the family, uh, the number of males of uh, certain ages and females of, uh, of different age groups. Uh, um, it's under, under um, so many years. And uh, then so the other, the continuing page of that, all sorts of names there, Baker, Hooper, Silliker, this is in Lot 26, which is our area here on the south side of the dump. Strickland, Weatherall, uh, Robbins, Cole, Price, uh, Ives. Not all of those are loyalists. Alexander Anderson, uh, McCollum. Uh, some of these aren't loyalist names, but they're listed in the census. And uh, then you've got family histories, as published in an island refuge or in other sources, and this is the original version of An Island of Refuge, uh, published in 1983, provides information on family histories. So where did they settle? Uh, the land allotted to them was owned by proprietors and had been offered for loyal settlement. You know that the island was, uh, in 1767, each of the townships was allotted through a lottery to either an individual or to two, split into two 10,000 acre parcels. So there was no um, grantable land uh, except uh, in the royalties, you know, around Princetown royalty, Charlottetown royalty. All of the other uh, land was privately owned. And uh, on the 29th of June, 1783, 18 proprietors submitted in London a petition to the Crown offering one quarter of their land gratis or free to loyal immigrants. So a number, the, the uh, proprietors, uh, there were about a hundred of them, had to, one of the stipulations was they had to settle their land or lose it, although this was never enforced. And so a group of the proprietors were persuaded, uh, I'm not sure uh, this is a study for someone to do, why these particular proprietors were induced to offer uh, land without charge to loyal immigrants. And they included Governor Walter Patterson, who was the owner of half of lots 17, 19, and 25, and John Townsend, half of lot 26. I'll come back to those uh, men later. The land granted to each family was recorded on maps. And uh, uh, the allocation on the map was only on a map. So when you see these, it, it, no land was laid out on the ground. So when they were granted land, when the Loyalists uh, arrived here, they and were given land grants, uh, they, the allotments uh, uh, occurred in Charlottetown, and it was on a map. You know, you, you had to then find your land on the ground if you... Um, uh, these original maps, and we've seen one before, survive in the Public Archives and Records Office, called the PARO, and serve as a starting point for pinpointing farm locations. Because they often didn't always settle on the allotted, well, the land that they were given as a grant. So, uh, a complication in mapping is that the land was not necessarily taken up, or even uh, settled on or even taken up, so that if you've got uh, all these uh, maps showing who, uh, people having um, uh, been allotted that land, they may not have settled in the deck at all. The, the uh, land grant allocation 
uh, was married refugees, 500 acres, single men refugees, 300 acres was the land grant, officers in the, mil the military side, 500 acres, non-commissioned officers, 200 acres, lower level officers, and then privates, ordinary soldiers could get 100 acres. Now, this map shows where they actually settled, not where they were uh, allotted land, and it's in, in the... Um, uh, and the, the loyalists are grouped in four distinct clusters, uh, the land grants, and we'll have to try and explain these. There's a cluster in Lot 19, right around the entrance to the Wilmot uh, River. That's the Wilmot. And uh, the, uh, that's the river there. So just Reed's Corner, basically. And, uh, but the northern half of Lot 25 is empty. Uh, the, the proprietor of that northern half hasn't offered, for whatever reason, land for settlement. So the next um, one, the, uh, the, those uh, in the southern part of Lot 25, has it gone off? Yep. Uh, uh, I don't know what the... Uh, I don't see it. Does it affect your hearing me? It does, mm -hmm. probably. It may be that... Um, uh, Maybe. Oh, there we are. Uh, I've turned it back on, and maybe the batteries are something. Anyway, uh, that's uh, a se the second group then in um, the north side of the Dump River estuary, and then on this side, there you've got that cluster. They're in a different um, township. The red lines mark the township boundaries, and then you get uh, a, a group in Lot 17. If, uh, just uh, to show, give you an idea of the land grants, this is, um, uh, I'll put some, this is uh, an, a satellite view of uh, Prince, eastern Prince County showing the uh, Blue Shank Road follows that red line at the bottom there, and uh, that's lot 19, the second half. The Kensington is there, the Red Bridge uh, is, is there, and so that's the southern part of the lot. Uh, Fourteen of the Bedeck Loyalists of the July uh, 1784 on the list were allotted line, uh, land in Lot 19. I just want to show you what that meant on a map for John, poor John Murray. Uh, he was given of his 500 acres, this is the 50-acre grant on the, uh, at the front here, near the water. But he, he happened to draw the, uh, and I'm sure it was in a sort of random draw from a hat, the last 450 acres, it was seven and a half miles inland uh, through, and this was all uh, wilderness forest, so uh, there wasn't going to be, and at the rate of clearing uh, three, four acres a year, on a, uh, which was the standard amount, uh, he's, he's, that's uh, for the future. You know, and actually he didn't take up that grant, he, he had it exchanged for something else in North of the Deck. But that's the, and um, this shows how, how land was allotted. This is the uh, uh, map uh, dating from after 1784, but this is the Wilmot Creek. This, is, this would be the road, the road that you travel when you go from Reed's Corner to Traveler's Rest. It's a French... Uh, uh, portage, and before that a Mi'kmaq portage, portage, and you can see uh, the, um, uh, let me click there, I'm not sure what came up, no, I'm not clicking in the right place here. The, um, and that shows, this shows the, the, the land grants of the, that extend all the way beyond Kensington, as I've shown you. I'm sure William Spearman must have been favored because he'd been given the best site, uh, the mill site, with the, the river here, and he's given the first of the 500. Though, in fact, he didn't take, although he was given this land, and it was part of his grant, he didn't actually settle there, but we're not going to talk about them in detail. And that uh, is an enlargement there, and uh, we can enlarge it even more. 
And the only four uh, of uh, uh, th those um, uh, are uh, four that seem to have settled in the uh, uh, township. Uh, uh, oh, no, it's that, uh, sorry. That's, these four are these, these four here. I'm just, this is just an explanation of, so that you can see what it's showing. Whereas the names on the other side, those are the names that settled in this, well, were not settled, where this is their particular grants. And you'll recognize some of the names and, and not others. Uh, Wharf became Waugh at some stage, and I'm not sure why, or how, why it was, and I don't know if we know why. So those are the names all on that map. Just to show you where we're talking about, uh, this is, um, uh, you'll re recognize the, the, the bridge here, the red bridge, and Reed's Corner is here and uh, enlarged, uh, and then um, this is uh, Cool Breeze Farm and the aerial photograph. So it's right in that middle between the Bouchank Road and Reed's Corner, and this bit here that's now uh, all built up. That, those were the land grants in Lot 19. And uh, uh, this uh, map is of interest because it's a later map uh, uh, before 1805, and what it says, lots purchased by Governor Fanning and signed by him, EFs. So that uh, uh, EF, uh, some of them have uh, here, E. you see the writing EF? So Fanning, the governor, these people have, a, have sold their land to the governor, uh, and he was the second governor of Prince Edward Island from 1786, so he's, he's in, uh, bought these land grants from these people who didn't want to settle on that area. And uh, those are the ones that uh, had marked. But I discovered this is not correct uh, more recently. I mean, the map is, uh, as, as stated in 1805, um, um, oh, uh, before 18, is not correct because uh, William Wright uh, later has a lawsuit against Palmer for this land. So perhaps it was uh, premature for Governor Fanning to have these lots assumed to have gone to him. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, these are the individuals who apparently did not settle in Bedeck. You know, there's no evidence. That their name is on, the, uh, uh, on maps, such as the one we've looked at, but they seem not to have settled on these grants. Uh, let's look at the ones that actually settled. And we'll start with uh, the southern half of Lot 19. And that's the cluster we've just been talking about. And these are the ones that, uh, the, the, men, the men who actually, you can find later records, John Small, who came later in the 1790s, John Laferty, they were later arrivals, so they, they must have purchased the land from people who moved on. George Maybe, Jonathan Palmer, and James Waugh. So those are, those are the loyalists who settled, in the sense I said earlier, permanently and created farms on that area. The others did not. It's not, they didn't necessarily leave the area. They may have gone to, as we shall see, some of them went to just another part of the deck. Uh, if we go to the southern half of Lot 25, uh, and look at these, this group, this is an early map, uh, about 1810, and these are the names of people who actually settled. John Murray, uh, Jesse Strang, uh, Richard Moorefield, David Murray, who is the son of John, uh, John MacDonald, and John Murray Jr., another son of uh, John Murray, Richard Price, and Samuel Jameson. And you can see that these, these, they, they're all here in North Bidet, uh, this is the Dunk River here. That would be where the bridge is now, uh, and a small bridge over, and then Jameson is, is over here. The, um, and here's another early map showing people who actually settled. That's, uh, uh, this map dates from 1808, and the roads there shown, that's the road to William Skirman's Mill in Wilmot Valley. It's, it's labeled 
as such. That's the McMurdo Road, although it's shown as a straight line there, and it certainly isn't a straight line, and probably never was. And that's the road, said the road to Alexander Campbell's, that's at, to, at the Red Bridge. So he was um, an important ship build, shipwright, uh, shipbuilder. And that's Route 1A. So the names that you have, that we know settled in that area, are those, because the names are on the map, Samuel Ricks, William Wright, Jesse Stang, William Murray, David Murray are on that particular map. Uh, just to note, the land cleared by the Bedeck Acadians, and I spell Bedeck as the French spelt it, between 1750 and 1758, played a role uh, in the um, uh, settlement of the Loyalists. On the north side of the Dunk Estuary, we know from uh, Laroque's census, they were largely of two families or clans, the Terrios and the Robichauds, and on the south side of the estuary, the Lejeunes, uh, living on the south. And we know exactly where they were settled. This is from Holland's original map. It's a photograph I took in London uh, uh, of the map in the archives. And you can see the location of the houses of the French uh, in um, uh, Lower Bedeck, and uh, unfortunately I didn't get, the photograph didn't catch, but you can see all the houses uh, in North Bedeck, and if we put a modern map showing the location, uh, these are the, if you plot them on a modern map, that's the Lower Bedeck Cemetery, uh, there are five houses in that immediate area, and that's, this is Herd's Point here, and there are quite a number of houses. In North Bedeck, uh, they're around the, um, uh, I don't know what that point is called, but there may have a name. Stafford Shore? Yeah, yeah Stafford Shore is, is along here. Okay. Yeah, and uh, this is where the uh, William Murray's house was, right at that point. And about there was um, Jesse Strang's house. We'll be talking more about that on Monday in uh, detail. So we know these are the loyalists who settled in um, uh, North Bedeck because they appear on maps and some genealogies and such. And those are the, the, the names of the ones who actually settled. That is the French, uh, that would be the area of when you transfer the French uh, clearing. And you can see Samuel Ricks and especially William Wright and maybe that reason that William Wright moved to North Bedeck rather than staying in um, uh, Reed's Corner area, because the land was, had been cleared. So, uh, uh, and he, uh, uh, this land belonged to Governor Patterson, so he, he I don't know, uh, research, more research to do to how, how the transaction was carried out, but he, he settled in that part rather than in um, uh, Reed's Corner. The northern half of lot uh, 26 had a large number of, uh, probably the largest cluster. Uh, this is the early map after 1784. And uh, it, um, the French cleared land is actually marked on the map, and I've just traced it there, and the French houses. Now these would have been copied from Holland's map. They wouldn't have been surveyed. Those are the, the French houses. They wouldn't have existed, uh, all of them, in 1784, but some of them may have. And so this is probably, uh, this also, you see, refugee share, is, is this portion here, but they also settled in areas that weren't allocated. So some of them, you know, if you've got um, uh, you know, 10 or 20 acres of cleared land, you're, you're going to, much more valuable than having to tackle uh, forests. So who are, who are these? These groups, if we, if we, uh, these are the names on the map. I just uh, put it vertically. These are the people who've been allocated land or whose names occur on the map in this particular area, going from the north, uh, where you get uh, Richard Price to uh, and Robbins. This is we were just hearing the top of the bridge. This is R. Richard and John Robbins, and there's Herd's Point. You see there, 200 acres. And that's the land that Isabella Robbins, uh, whom we heard in the previous lecture, would have gone to. So uh, this, these are the ones that appear to have actually settled in um, uh, the lower Bedeck area. Uh, the, uh, uh, I've only uh, 
darken the names because they didn't show up so well in yellow. So, Spearman, Baker, uh, Nathaniel Wright, I'll be talking about him on Monday, uh, Jameson, Wells, Siliker, uh, which that would be the far location of the farm of those four generations, is just, uh, uh, that's the, so it's, uh, there's uh, uh, Bedeck and Central Bedeck, so it's just really at the base of the, uh, the road there that leads down. Uh, and then the two latecomers, Alexander Anderson and Donald McFarland, uh, settled well out in Seacow Head area because all the land had been taken elsewhere. But there were there was loyalist uh, land grants available there, and they took them up very late. Uh, in the eastern half, we'll go to Lot 17. The eastern half of Lot 17, the western half of Lot 17 is over here. Uh, and uh, th th there's an early map uh, from 1784 with later editions, and it has two layers of names, and they've been they're almost caught, one's in red ink and the other. They were regranted, or people weren't satisfied with the first. Uh, but these are the names on the map, all arriving after 1784. Uh, Daniel Green, Benjamin Darby, George Linkletter, all well-known loyalists of that area. But the others, John Foy, John Welling, um, less so, and John Small, uh, uh, certainly left descendants. Major Hooper is, I uh, don't think, settled there, but he was given land for surveying. And which I showed you this map before, which uh, shows the, the two uh, grants of um, uh, uh, Green and Darby. So this is where the link, George Linkletter seems to have come later. It's a bit of a mystery. Uh, uh, because he's listed in the 1798 census of, as being in lot uh, 11, uh, way up there, whatever he was doing there. But Benjamin Darby, Daniel Green, that would be the approximate location. And then we have a John Welling uh, at that point, who seems to have left. So in the end, this is the summary of, uh, it's on the poster. Uh, these are the loyalists recorded around Bedeck Harbor in the 1798 census all of them listed here. Um, uh, even the census has missed someone out. John Small uh, is missing from the census, but he was definitely there from land records. And so somebody, either somebody missed copy or something. And then you've got um, uh, Bedeck Harbor loyalists. That, those are the ones on the, uh, who arrived here in 1784, but did not, are recorded elsewhere in 1798, such as John Brecken, George Linkletter, as I mentioned, Donald McFarland, um, uh, and it, uh, so it tells you a bit of, it's all on the board there. Nathaniel Wright was at Tryon in 1798, and only later came. He's the son of William Wright. Uh, and then other loyalists, this information, I'm just, it's just a, that, that more or less summarizes who the Bedeck uh, loyalists were and their status. So um, the next question is where did they settle? But now we're going to look at why did they settle in these areas. And this story is told in this poster. And uh, we want to know why did they settle in those particular areas? It's very uh, specific. And why did they come? Why did they come to Bedeck in the first place? And this is the big reveal: who they. <laughs> who the true fa uh, father of Bedeck is. It's uh, none other than our first governor, Captain Walter Patterson, Lieutenant Governor, initially Governor and then Lieutenant Governor of the Island of St. John between those years, 1769 to 1786. It's often assumed uh, that um, uh, the main, main man responsible was William Skirman, uh, himself a loyalist who settled on the lot. And he played a role. He went to Shelburne uh, and recruited a group of loyalist set refugees and disbanded soldiers to come to the island. But this man, Walter Patterson, is the key instigator of it. And the reason is that he, oops, I jumped ahead there. He uh, was uh, one of the original grantees of Lot 19 with his brother. They put in a joint application 
and uh, when the lot was divided, Walter Patterson uh, acquired or was allotted uh, the southern half of lot 19. That's precisely where all of those loyalists had been given land grants. Uh, that's the Wilmot River there. His brother John uh, was allotted uh, in a, it's a, it was a, a, a drawing from the hat, you know, it wasn't at any choice. Uh, he got the northern half. But, uh, let me see. The uh, Walter uh, Patterson also acquired land in the area, and so you can see that this western half of Lot 17 and the uh, uh, southern part of Lot 25, North Bedeck area, where the Loyalists were also settled. Now, uh, pa Patterson had bought these parcels of land, these additional parcels, in, and also uh, in, in, he had bought those parcels in uh, November 9, 1781, so three years before the Loyalists arrived, at a land auction held in Charlottetown, which had been organized by his government. Uh, he also seems to have had an interest in the northern part of Lot 26. This man, John Townsend, it appears to be a front for his acting on behalf of Patterson. Uh, so Patterson also seems to have an interest in that lot, uh, in terms of its ownership. Uh, uh, there's my voice as... Uh, I'll do, see if this works again. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. It just needs a bit of stimulus, I guess. <laughs> the, um, so, um, these particular lots that he's um, uh, bought, as well as others, especially around Charlottetown, had been chosen by Patterson and his supporters on the council for distraint. That's a legal process. Pardon? Valerie? Yeah, I'm sorry. Roland has a question, I think. Sorry, Doug. I just had a question about the timing that Patterson purchased. Is that before or after the Battle of Yorktown? It's 1781, so it's um, same, same November, November. November. I don't know when the Battle of the Yorktown. Battle was before November, so. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think it. Um, uh, this this was a separate issue in, in Prince Edward Island that didn't have anything to do with the loyalists at that stage. And I'll just explain that. Sure. Uh, these particular lots as well as others, especially around Charlottetown, had been chosen by Patterson for what I call distraint, and that was seizure by the government uh, from their owners, uh, who were absentee proprietors, uh, mostly living in Britain, for subsequent sale at a public auction. And uh, because the owners uh, had not fulfilled the, the stipulations of their 1767 grants. So he's the governor. Uh, they have not settled people on their land with a specified number of settlers, nor had they paid the quitrents, the tax on the land. But Patterson was very selective in selecting the lots that, were, that his government seized for resale. Uh, distant, remote lots were not put up for sale, you know, lot one or lot two way up west. They were all either in the Charlottetown area, valuable lots and near, near at hand, or in the Bedeck area, where Patterson already had land. Though he was acting in accordance with an island law that the British government was aware of and had not disannulled, so it was legal, his action, he failed to obtain prior approval from the British government for the seizure. Of the, he didn't get approval to do that for the seizure of these particular lots by the government and their auction. And his own purchase of much of the auctioned land, which he did not reveal to the London government, was suspect. Mm -hmm. So not only did he seize the land, put them up for auction, 
and if you're the only bidder, you're going to get these fairly easily. When the proprietors in Britain eventually learned of his action, they protested to the government and the sales were nullified, the auction and the British government in May, in May 1783, now it's two years later they've learned, and they said, no, this auction is disannulled, uh, with the stipulation that the lots be returned to the original owners, and the buyers, that would be Patterson, be compensated for any costs. Well, he learned of this nullification in December 1783, so that's two years after the auction, but instead of complying with it, he just ignored it. Uh, at the same time, he did not tell his counsel. So he's got this letter telling him to return the lots to the original owners. He just, this was a real, you can imagine. Uh, uh, so what he did instead, as part of the uh, it was then that he proceeded to complicate the whole matter by placing loyalist settlers on this land. So, he's uh, ignoring that the, the sale has been declared illegal, and he goes ahead in 1784 to bring loyalist settlers to uh, get on this land. You can see what he, he's doing here. He's complicating, making it more difficult for the land to be returned. As part of the uh, process of uh, 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 attracting loyalist settlers, he put an advertisement, it must come from him, in the Royal Gazette. Uh, uh, it's dated 30th of December, November 1782, published in March 1783, and it's uh, appealing to loyalists who are um, loyal refugees who are uh, still in, uh, well, in 1782, and when it was dated, most of them were still in New York. And uh, the, uh, it uh, appeals, it describes the island very favorably, uh, and most of the soil is good, well wooded, free from rocks, which is very true compared to the rest of the Maritimes, good climate, fevers and agues unknown, water everywhere excellent, um, and a great variety of shell and most sorts of fish, trying to attract loyalist settlers. Uh, this letter was signed by the, the members of the regiment that was then in Charlottetown, some of whom subsequently settled. So it's as if he's gone to the local regiment and said, can you put an advert in the paper, uh, New York paper, which uh, uh, advertises the attractiveness of this island. Then in October, so that's uh, in the spring of 1783 uh, that it was published, uh, and then in uh, October uh, he issued a proclamation from his government, uh, as shown there, uh, again trying to attract loyalist settlement, uh, claiming, uh, 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 invited refugees, <coughs> provincial troops, other American immigrants, then at Shelburne, and elsewhere to settle on the island, offering them and the same sort of land free of every expense, that is free land, not uh, tenant land, neither mountainous, rocky, nor swampy, and preferable to other unoccupied land throughout His Majesty's American Dominion, which was Nova Scotia, New Brunswick at that stage, and that the proprietors have very generously given up um, uh, the control or, you know, the land be settled by the Loyalists. Uh, and it, by the time, however, that Patterson issued this proclamation, almost all of the refugees had already left New York and were then at Shelburne or St. John. And it was into this uncertain um, <coughs> business uh, that William Skirman walked. According to family tradition, Skirman had arrived on the island in the late summer of 1783 and has settled temporarily at Tryon. He seems to have scouted the Bedeck Bay area, or, more likely, he was informed by Governor Patterson of the availability of land there. And, And, let's come back, uh, uh, he, 
At any rate, in May 1784, William Spearman and Thomas Hooper appeared before the council in Charlottetown and asked that land at Bedeck Bay be reserved for them and for other settlers whom they would bring to the island. The, the council agreed to hold the land until August 1st. Thus it was that William Spearman returned on July 26 to Charlottetown from Shelburne with 18 loyalist refugees and 10 disbanded soldiers. And all of these men were allocated land on either Patterson's part of Lot 19, as you've seen, on his land in Lot 25, which was the North Bedeck side, or in Lot 26 on the south side of the Dunk, which, uh, as a result of the auction, was in the ownership of John Townsend, a pro Patterson protege, seemingly. He did not attempt to place any settlers on the western part of Lot 17, which was one of the lots <coughs> he had purchased, perhaps because it would have been very evident to anyone just sailing along the shoreline that it was very unsuitable for settlements. That's Muddy Creek and uh, you know areas uh, west of Muskush. The reason that Patterson was anxious to place uh, settlers on his land, apart from it assisting with the settlement of his lot, was that if these lands were already occupied, and especially if they had been given up by the new owners to refugees and provincial troops, overturning the results of the auction would cause great problems. It would also complicate the return of the lots to the original proprietors. Thus it was that the loyalists who came to the deck bay were unwitting pawns in a dispute between the island's governor and the government in Britain which was being pressed by the dispossessed owners of the land. The auction sales were eventually annulled, and Patterson lost all control of them and had to return them. And it was, they were returned to the original proprietors. Even so, the loyalists were not dispossessed of their lands. They, their title was, was recognized. Their titles uh, were eventually acknowledged. It, it took some years, and they were not displaced. The, uh, so the, um, the, oops, the, uh, and so Walter Patterson is the ultimate instigator of the Bedeck Bay Loyalist Settlement. However, William Skurman is still to be given credit for bringing the, the actual settlers from Shelburne, and without the role that he played, the settlement would also not have been founded, at least not founded as with the people that he, that he brought. Thus, perhaps we should recognize both, perhaps, or Governor Patterson and William Spearman as the joint founders of the Bedeck Harbor Settlement. So that is the, you, you now see the true founder of the Bedeck Loyalist Settlement in front of you, and if you have any questions, I would be pleased to answer them. So thank you very much.